Uh, it is great to have you with us. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Uh, thank you for all that you do. Me and Matthew 5 this morning, Matthew 5, verses 27 to 30. So again, working through the Sermon on the Mount this summer. Uh, just two quick things. Uh, one, uh, again, we have our church history class that meets on Sunday nights at 7 o'clock. So we'll be over at the COG offices tonight at 7. Even if you haven't been able to make it yet, uh, we'd love to have you join us tonight. Uh, again, just for one hour. Uh, but that's been a great time with a great group just to learn a little bit more about who we are as followers of Jesus where we've come from and the lessons that we can learn uh, from those who have gone before us. And then secondly, just as a heads up over the next couple of weeks with where we're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we're going to be hitting on issues related to marriage, adultery, divorce, sexuality, uh, lust in particular today. So just uh, parents with kids who are in the service, just so you're aware, uh, I don't think it's overboard, uh, but just wanted you to have a heads up on where we're going to be this week and next week. So I'm going to pray. Uh, we'll jump in today, Matthew 5, 27 to 30. Father, we thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather and to open your word once again, to hear your voice to us. And Father, as we talk today about fighting sin, uh, about living uh, in light of your commands and your desires for us, I pray that there are some here this morning who would experience freedom uh, in a way that they have not experienced in many years. That there are some who would have a love for you kindled this morning that would allow them to leave behind uh, temptations that have entangled them, desires that have entangled them, and that, God, we would move into a place as a community and as a people where we could be uh, the salt of the earth and the city on the hill that you're calling us to be, especially when it comes to our relationships and the issues we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks. Father, we love you. We ask this all in your son's name. Amen. All right, while we jump in, I'm just going to go ahead and read our text this morning. Just four verses, but we've got a lot of work to do today. Matthew 5, 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said, this is Jesus speaking, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Some severe words from Jesus this morning. As we are in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, again, where Jesus is teaching us what does it mean to be perfect as God is perfect to try and live out the example of Jesus in the communities that we find ourselves. That if we could faithfully live out Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we would become, uh, in a very real way, not just in name only, a city of God in the city of Lafayette, reflecting the character, the love, and the heart of Christ. And last week we saw the implications this would have for our attitudes toward anger and forgiveness. And in the next two weeks we're going to be looking at what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus in issues related to uh, marriage, divorce, sexuality, and in particular today Jesus addresses the issue of lust. Again, Jesus jumps in in verse 27 with these words, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. And again, we're in a section where Jesus is constantly turning the audience's attention back to an Old Testament command and then showing them the deeper meaning underneath the surface level of that command. So last week it was, you've heard that it was said, you shall not murder, but I tell you, don't be angry. Jesus begins this week with, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Straight from Exodus 20, 14, one of the Ten Commandments. And again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on marriage specifically this week. That will be more next week. But Jesus opens with a command here that honestly, probably most of his listeners in the first century had kept this command. Again, Dr. Pennington, who wrote the, the study guides that we've been supplied with this morning, uh, writes of this instruction from Jesus, it's likely that actual adultery did not occur that often in first century Jewish culture. Again, they had these commands from God, and they lived in a culture where honor and shame was a very big idea, and it would have been seen as a shameful thing to commit adultery or to cause someone to commit adultery. And so surface-level obedience to this command was probably pretty high, that there were many listening to Jesus 
who probably thought, okay, I've, I've done what God has asked me to do in this area, and yet, like last week, in one sentence, Jesus takes a command that we think we have under control and makes everyone guilty of breaking it in one fell swoop. Verse 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Once again, Jesus opens the command to show us the motivation underneath it and says, you might not ever have physically committed adultery, but if you've lusted after a man, if you've lusted after a woman, you've committed adultery in some sense, Jesus' words here, in your heart and in your mind. And again, he immediately makes the crowd realize they haven't been as faithful to the commands of God as they thought. Again, we're seeing that what Jesus is calling us to is more than mere superficial outward obedience to God's commands, and he's trying to transform our hearts and minds to be hearts and minds that reflect the character of God and the motivations of God, and that's part of what he's doing in particular in this text here in regard to our views of sexuality. Now, before we get into how to fight our struggle against lust, it's worth mentioning what lust is not, because sometimes I think we can get confused about this. First, Jesus is not saying that finding someone beautiful or physically attractive is a sin. God has hardwired us to recognize beauty in the world around us, and one of the places that we see that beauty is in other human beings. And Jesus' goal here is not to get you to a place where you don't recognize that there are others who are are attractive or beautiful in the world, because if that was the goal, if getting rid of lust means I find nobody else attractive, then that is an impossible thing that Jesus is calling us to do, given how we're wired. And second, what Jesus is saying here is that he's not saying that having a desire for sex or sexual intimacy is a bad thing. The desire for intimacy is actually a desire that has been given to you by God to be used in a God-honoring way. This should go without saying, but often we forget it. God created sex. He gave it to us as a gift to be experienced within the boundaries that he's set. And again, some people approach the issue of lust with this thought, for me to conquer lust, I have to remove all desire for sexual intimacy from my heart. And if that has been your goal, to just get that desire completely out of you, no wonder you've been frustrated in your battle against this sin because That is a desire that God has placed within most people that he does not remove. Again, for some of you, this might be a startling realization. The Bible does not have a negative view of sexual intimacy. Does it warn us about misusing sex? Yes. Does it say we can be tempted to sin against God in sexual ways? Absolutely. But what we see first and foremost is this, is that sex was given to us by God as a gift for our good and for our joy, again, within the boundaries that God has set. For some, those who most need to see that sex is actually a good thing is some who grew up in the church, like myself, who was primarily told sex is a a, a dirty, terrible, disgusting thing, so save it for the one that you love. And so we had this approach where we saw it as this bad thing for years, and then no wonder we struggled to make the transition once we were married to say, no, now this is a good God-honoring thing. It is a gift given to us by God. I think Pastor Ray Ortland summarizes the biblical wisdom on sex well when he writes, the key to understanding the sexual wisdom of the Bible is to combine both form and freedom, structure and liberation. Conservative people love form and restraint and control. Progressive people love freedom and openness and choices. Both see part of the truth, but wisdom sees more. Wisdom teaches us that God gave us our sexuality both to focus our romantic joy and to unleash our romantic joy. When our desires are both focused and unleashed, there's both form and freedom. Our sexual experience becomes becomes wonderfully intensified. A marriage can flourish within both form and freedom because sex is like a fire. In the fireplace, it keeps us warm. Outside the fireplace, it burns the house down. Here's the message of the Bible. Keep the fire within the marital fireplace and stoke that fire as hot as you can get it. 
Now, the problem with lust is that it takes the fire that was meant to be in the fireplace and it begins to scatter the fire all over the house. And before we press much deeper into this, we need to ask the question, what actually is lust? What is Jesus warning us against here? A few of the scholars I was reading this week defined the idea in some different ways, but ultimately they have the same root. For example, Dr. Pennington, again, who was here a few weeks ago, says lust is this. Here's how he defines it. Using the gift of the imagination for the purpose of fantasizing about and objectifying someone as a sexual partner. Craig Blomberg, the desire to have sexual relations with someone other than one's spouse. John Nolan, lust is a look that has sexual arousal in mind. It might involve contemplating the steps to acting on that desire in one's imagination. Craig Keener, Jesus refers not to noticing a person's beauty but to meditating on it, and in meditating on it, seeking to possess it. We see in Scripture, in the Bible, sexual intimacy is meant to be experienced between one man and one woman within the bond of marriage. And when sex is experienced there, it can be a beautiful, God-honoring thing. But if we're being honest, there's moments we're tempted to want to experience that intimacy with someone who isn't our spouse. And so our minds begin to wander, and that's what Jesus is pressing into here. Again, whether you're already married, you're dating, you're single, anytime you entertain the thought of sexual intimacy and oneness with someone who is not your spouse, we're entering into the area of lust that Jesus is describing here. Now, the question that people have, and it's a good question, is this, why does Jesus care so much about something that only happens in my mind? I'm not actually hurting anyone. I'm not actually cheating on my spouse. I'm not actually physically sinning. Why does what happens, why is what happens in my heart and my mind so important? And I think part of the reason we struggle to see the seriousness of lust is this. We've lost the seriousness and the weight of sex. Because as sex crazed as our culture has become, it often has a far too low view of physical intimacy. We see something of its power in Genesis 2.24. When God brings Adam and Eve together and we read these words, you hear them at every wedding you attend. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And when God gave human beings the gift of marriage, he intended for that man and the woman to experience this this new reality, this one flesh kind of life. But what does that mean? What does it mean to have a one flesh relationship? Ortland writes elsewhere, I think, this helpful definition. One flesh is essential to the biblical view of marriage. It means one mortal life fully shared. Two selfish me's start to think like one unified us, sharing our everything. One life, one reputation, one bed, one suffering, one budget, one family, one mission, and so forth. No barriers, no hiding, no aloofness. Now total openness with total sharing and total solidarity until death parts them. Moreover, Jesus explained that behind the word become, God is there, what God has joined together. He also made it clear that the word they in Genesis 2.24 means the two, thus establishing the one man, one woman as the biblical norm. What we see then is that marriage is not a product of human social evolution. It came from God. He defined it. He has the right to because it belongs to him. And it's this understanding of the one flesh aspect of marriage that begins to get at the root issue of lust. Because God's goal for all who would be married is that they would experience total oneness together, emotionally, physically, spiritually. And we'll see next week when we specifically talk about marriage that there is a power in physical intimacy that brings a couple together and binds them in a unique and special way. That our sexuality was meant to draw us close and deep to one other person in this life as we attempt to grow closer to Jesus together as a couple. But lust is an action of the heart and the mind that wages war against that oneness. This is the root problem of lust. It's fighting against the oneness that God wants us to experience with one other person. 
And so if I'm not married yet, lust gives me a desire for that intimacy with a person who's not my spouse, who may not end up being my spouse, who may be somebody else's spouse one day. And again, it's dividing that oneness of heart and mind that God desires for us. If we're already married and we're battling against lust, there is a war being waged for the oneness of our marriage. Because it's hard for me to experience close intimacy with my spouse when I'm thinking about sharing that intimacy with someone who isn't them. We see how it begins to to tear at this one flesh relationship that God desires for us. But maybe more than anything else, lust warps our view of God's purpose and intention for marriage. Because at its core, marriage is an opportunity to be Jesus to another person in a significant way to lay our lives down for them, to serve them, and that physical intimacy is experienced within this relationship where spouses are giving themselves to and for one another. This is why Paul writes in Ephesians 5.25, Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did Jesus love the church? With focused passion and desire and purpose, giving up everything for his people. And so we see that marriage works when two people come together from the mindset of, I'm going to lay my life down for this other person. But what lust does is it allows us to entertain the thought and the pleasure of that physical intimacy without any of the sacrifice, without any of the giving ourselves to another person in a very real way. And rather than that intimacy creating a one flesh relationship with another person, person, lust allows me to use that other person in the moment for my own pleasure without all that God intended to be bound up in that expression of our sexuality. Now, if you're here this morning and you're struggling with lust, don't feel bad because I think it's a much more common struggle than people realize. I think we know that. It's just hard to say. Because with how easy it is to have unlimited access to pornography at the touch of a button, how much entertainment we can consume that ignites lust within us, and how sexually promiscuous our culture has become, escaping the snare of lust may seem like an impossibility. And there were years of my life where I just had the thought, this is not a temptation I will ever be able to fully overcome. Its power is too strong, its clutches are too deep, and maybe you're here this morning and you feel like that, but Jesus really does seem to think it's something we can overcome. Because look at what he says in verses 29 and 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you uh, lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Again, the assumption being it's possible to overcome lust or any temptation that you face. It's going to take work. It's going to be difficult. It might cost us something, but it's possible is the assumption of Jesus. And at the end of the day, the fight against lust is a fight that we cannot afford to lose. I say that because Jesus sets it up as if you're not fighting this, if you're not resisting this, if you're not doing everything that you can to push this temptation away, it's possible. These are his words twice in these two verses. It could lead you to hell. Not because it's a uniquely damnable sin, but because sexual desires within us have the potential maybe more than anything else that we're tempted with, to harden our hearts toward God, to harden our hearts toward other people, and to ultimately lead us away from Jesus. I've been a pastor here for 13 years. I have lost count of the number of people who are faithfully following Jesus, who are no longer here with us, who at the end of the day simply decided, I'm tired of fighting the sexual desires that I have that I know are outside of the will of God. And when the choice came down to faithfulness to God or faithfulness to what I want to do, they chose themselves. And I don't look down. That's a hard fight. That's a hard, but I understand the struggle there. But we have to recognize that if we're stepping in here this morning and thinking this isn't that big of a deal, Jesus says, no, your eternal destiny may be at stake in how you fight this. 
For as little or as small a thing as we see lust that happens in our heart and mind, we don't often see that the seeds that we plant in our heart and mind often lead to some kind of harvest that we didn't see coming. Steve Farrar said it well in his book, Finishing Strong, when he writes of sin, sin will often take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you're willing to pay. And again, we see that, and again, those seeds that are planted in our heart and mind, maybe we're not acting on them now, but we don't see the ways that they're slowly hardening our heart to the things of God, slowly hardening our hearts to the truth of God's word, and ultimately, potentially, leading us away from Jesus himself. And so if we want to try and overcome lust, what do we do? The rest of this sermon is going to be very practical and hopefully helpful. If we're addicted to pornography, if we have these thoughts we can't seem to shake, if we're feeling, feeling pulled away from our spouse and toward somebody else in our lives, what do we do? The rest of this has been gleaned from 20 years in ministry of trying to help people through these issues. Some of this is going to sound very easy and basic, but sometimes I think we just simply overcomplicate the fight against sin. But one of the things we have to recognize is this, the way Jesus describes it, it is a fight. It is a struggle. But there are ways to overcome these things that have power over us. So how do we overcome lust? And not even lust. Maybe lust isn't your big struggle. How do we overcome any impulse to sin that we're fighting? A couple things I would ask. These will build on each other ultimately to the most important one. First, are you doing what you can to be a physically healthy person? Now, you might be wondering, what in the world does that have to do with fighting sin in my life? But I'd want to ask questions like, are you getting enough sleep? Are you exercising and taking care of your body? Are you watching what you eat and trying to be a healthy person? person because we have to remember that God created us as integrated people, body and spirit. And what we do physically has spiritual ramifications in our lives. And what we do spiritually often has physical ramifications in our lives. And when I talk to most people who are struggling with lust, they confess it's worse and it's easier to give in when I'm tired and I'm staying up late and I'm being lazy and I'm binging entertainment and I'm not taking care of myself. And there are physical things that we can do to put ourselves in a better situation to be able to resist the temptation that comes into our lives. Good decisions tend to produce more good decisions, and when you're taking care of yourself physically, spiritually, it's a boost, and it gives us this ability and this power that God has placed within us to be able to resist these things. But secondly, on the other side of that, maybe to the person who doesn't struggle with not taking care of themselves, secondly, are you working too hard because overwork and overstress can also make it difficult for us to resist sin? Is there a little margin in your life for rest and recharging and getting close to Jesus? Because as one pastor put it, the problem is this, overworking often leads to overcomforting. And we get ourselves into a place where we're worn down, we're tired, we're exhausted, even with good things. And it's so easy to justify the temptations that we're facing simply by telling ourselves, I've been good for a long time. I deserve this. I deserve a night off. I've done a lot of good things. I've got the scales tipped in my favor. Or we can simply just have this strong urge to feel comfort because everything else in our lives is just worn out. Are we taking seriously God's instruction in Scripture that we're physical human beings with physical needs, and if we're not taking care of ourselves, it's going to be a lot harder to fight against sin? Third, are you doing what's necessary to remove the source of temptation from your life? Again, Jesus uses very strong language in this text to talk about our response to fighting sin. If your eye is causing you to sin, what does Jesus say? Gouge it out. If your hand is causing you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. And that sounds extreme. And I don't think Jesus wanted to be taken literally, although there are some throughout church history who did take him very literally here. The church father Origen, who castrated himself out of trying to be faithful to this text, only to discover that didn't remove the lust from his heart, which I'm sure was a disappointing realization. St. Benedict, who when he was overcome by lust, would strip himself naked and throw himself into a thorn bush until the thought was gone. 
And only when his desire had subsided would he begin to remove the thorns from his body. Now, it's easy for me to read stories like that and smirk and wonder what were they doing and look down on them and know these are not the application points from this text this morning. But as I'm tempted to shrug off what they did, at least they were serious about fighting their sin. And I'm convicted by, while I might not want to go to those extremes, how often I'm simply unwilling to be inconvenienced or to sacrifice the smallest thing in my fight against the sin that's in my heart. What are you doing to remove the source of temptation? If you're most likely to be tempted to lust while looking at your phone in bed before you go to sleep at night, then leave your phone in another room. And already, I I can feel in the hearts of some this, but I can't do that. I need it for an alarm. And we have all of these ways that we justify we can't be parted from this thing that may be spiritually killing us. And yet, what does Jesus say? Whatever it is, gouge it out, throw it away, get rid of it. The price of your soul is not worth the convenience if that's where the struggle is. If social media is the struggle, if that's where you're most tempted to lust, get off of it. Again, in our day and age, that feels impossible. I need it for business. I need it for networking with other people. I need it to stay connected to others. And again, Jesus seems to be saying in this text that not being as connected to other people as you are is a small price to pay when compared with his uh, command here that lust may lead you into a place where your whole body is thrown into hell or separated from God forever. Again, I'm not saying that's a sin issue. Keeping your phone by the bed at night is not a sin thing. Being on social media is not a a sin thing. It's not a right and wrong thing. It's what is the source of my temptation and do I need to remove it? Maybe it's a relationship in your life where if you're just being honest, there's somebody who's not your spouse, but when you're around them and close to them and you look for opportunities to be near them, you feel that impulse welling up inside of you and you simply need to end that relationship. Again, these drastic measures we see here from Jesus. Maybe it means removing the source of temptation that Monday morning at work you won't be able to talk with your coworkers about the latest movie or television show because you know there are scenes in it that would have ignited lustful thoughts within you. And we just have to know as we're working through the Sermon on the Mount that as we pursue holiness and righteousness, we cannot do that if a primary concern in our life is fitting in with the people around us. Okay, as we begin to see these things, again, they're continuing to build. I would ask this, if lust is a struggle or if any sin is a struggle, do you have good Christian friends you can talk with about it? Who are you open and honest with? Who has access to your life that's not your spouse? Because part of the reason that Jesus gave us the church was so we could have Christian brothers and sisters who could walk with us and help us when we're weak and where we're weak. One of the best things you can do to fight any sin is to bring it into the light, is to let others know about it so they can ask, they can encourage, they can be involved in your fight against this thing. And if you don't feel like you have those kinds of relationships, how can you take advantage of the places that we've tried to create to find those small groups, men's ministry, women's ministry, these places that are set up for you to go deep with other believers so you can have these kinds of conversations. And if you have the thought, I can't have conversations about this stuff with other Christians because I'm the only one struggling with that. You just have to get over that idea because as a pastor, I will tell you, that's not the case. You'd be shocked at who is struggling with what in this church. You'd be shocked. Just, it's, sin is everywhere. Now, that's a handful of practical things you can do, and here's my guess. Some of you are here this morning, and you've struggled with lust your whole life, and the thought is, this was a waste of time because I've tried all that. And growing up, I had friends who I wanted to keep me accountable, and I tried to stop watching the things that would kindle lust in my heart, and I tried to remove the source of temptation, and I've read the books, and I've listened to the talks, and I've done the things that I'm supposed to do to overcome this sin, and you're simply resigned to the fact that the impulse is too strong, and for whatever reason, there's no way that you can let go of it. For years, that's how I felt. That again, I did everything I was told to do, and yet nothing seemed to work to free me from this impulse. But my guess is that impulse is not actually as strong as you think it is. Here's what I mean. In his book, The Obedience Option, David Haig illustrates what he calls overwhelming 
faith. Heg was talking to a young man who claimed he couldn't stop his pattern of sleeping with different women. The young man knew it was wrong, but he also claimed his lust was inevitable. Therefore, it wasn't his fault, especially since God had created him with such strong desires and urges. Finally, Hag interrupted the young man and said this, Suppose I came into your room and caught you and your girlfriend as you were starting this inevitable process, and I took out 10 $100 bills and told you you could have them if you stopped. What would you do? When the young man quickly said he'd rather have the cash, Hag asked, so what happened to the irresistible force of lust? He concluded with these words, we both realized a very simple truth. One passion may seem irresistible until a greater passion comes along. If we take this principle into the arena of righteous living, it comes out like this. The only way to overcome a passion for sin is with an overwhelming passion for righteousness or for God himself. And what I've discovered over the years is that there were years of my life where I solely focused on resisting particular temptations. And all I thought about was how much I did not want to do these handful of things. And yet I failed over and over again because what I didn't realize is when you are removing a significant desire or passion for your life, the only way to actually remove that is to consume it with a stronger desire or passion. N.T. Wright in his book, Paul for Everyone, says it this way, think of an animal you'd be really afraid of, whether it's an angry rhinoceros or a large spider. If you came around a corner and found yourself facing it, what would you do? Run away, of course, is what most of us would do. And as a follower of Jesus, that's how we should feel about a lifestyle of greed and lust and jealousy and injustice, whatever sin it is that you're running from. And some of you have been trying to run from sin for years, but you feel like you're not getting anywhere. But the other piece of it, he writes, is this. Then think how you'd feel if you saw the person you loved the most in the entire world who you hadn't seen for years walking down the street. What would you do? You would chase after him or her, of course. That's how we behave when we think of Jesus and the new life that he's offering the world. The mistake we've made, the mistake I made for years is this, is that I was trying to run from sin without running toward Jesus at the same time. Because it's in running to Jesus and drawing close to him and getting to know him at a deeper level that we come to discover just how beautiful Jesus is, just how powerful the truth of the gospel is, that we see the compassion and the mercy and the love that he extends to us, and we discover the closer we get to Jesus that what our hearts have been looking for and we thought lust or greed or these other sinful desires would satisfy are ultimately only satisfied in him. And when our hearts find rest in Jesus, we can finally rest from many of the temptations that we've never been able to overcome. Not perfectly, and we're still going to struggle and stumble, but when we truly fall in love with Jesus, it does get much easier to fall out of love with the sins that have wrapped us in their clutches for years. This is exactly how Paul describes the process of spiritual transformation. 2 Corinthians 3.18. The band can come up. We're going to sing here in just a second. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Notice the progression. We behold the face of the Lord and then we're transformed. As we look and focus more on Jesus, we are changed and our hearts are changed. Our affections are changed. The things we are pursuing are changed. And so as we get closer to Jesus, as our focus is on him, as we gather for worship and open our Bibles and pray, as we read books that stir up our affection for Jesus and have conversations with other believers that point us to Jesus, not because we have to, but because we truly love our Savior who has given us all things, you will be amazed at the power that those sinful impulses begin to lose in your heart and mind. 
And I know what some of you are thinking as we get ready to wrap up. That sounds great for most people, but that's not a way I can change because if change happens by getting close to Jesus, then change isn't going to happen in my life because Jesus wouldn't want anything to do with someone like me, especially with what I've done in this area. And in a room this size, surely some of you walked in here and there's sexual sin in your life right now. There's lust you're battling even in uh, the days and moments leading up to walking into this service. And they've been a part of your life for years and you're thinking, what hope is there for someone like me? One of my favorite books in the Bible is 1 Corinthians. You might think some churches are messed up in our culture when you look at them. And then the Corinthian church would look at us and say, hold our communion wine, because this was a seriously messed up church. And I say hold our communion wine because one of their struggles was getting drunk at communion, which boggles my mind how that could have been happening. And sexual immorality taking place that even the pagans looked in on some in that church and said, what are they doing? And Paul has this church full of people who came out of backgrounds that you would never expect to be close to Jesus or spiritual or be sitting in a church service, and Paul reminds them of this in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, when he looks out at this church and says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And as Paul reads those words to the Corinthians, the irony is he's just described most of that church. These are the things they were doing before they were introduced to the gospel. And so if you find yourself in Paul's description, you're in good company and you shouldn't lose hope because look at the next verse that Paul writes. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Again, we can all probably find ourselves in that list somewhere. And as we read through the Sermon on the Mount, we should be getting convicted of sin every single week. If you don't read the Sermon on the Mount and have these thoughts, I'm not as obedient to Jesus as I thought I was. You're not hearing what Jesus is saying in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But the hope in that is this, that regardless of who you are and what you've done, Jesus is inviting you to come to him today because our ability to come to Jesus isn't about the good things that we've done for him, but what he has done for us that we could never do for ourselves. And so the one who we read about in the Gospels is the friend of tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes, has his arms open wide to you this morning, regardless of what your life has looked like in this area up to this point, because coming to Jesus is about putting our hope and trust in a person who did for us what we could not do on our own, who lived the sinless, perfect life that you and I could never live who died on the cross for that sin that you and I have committed, Jesus goes to the cross and takes it on himself, and in that moment while he is there, receives the judgment of God for your sin and mine. He pays the debt that we owed to God. And then we see this promise that if we will love Jesus and trust Jesus, regardless of who we have been up to this moment, we can have our sins forgiven, we can be brought into the family of God, And we can have the hope of new life and letting go of these things that have entangled us for years because Jesus promises us that if we will come to him, he will wash us, he will sanctify us, he will make us holy, and we can be declared innocent in the sight of God, not because we deserve it, but solely out of the mercy and love of Jesus for us. And that's a love, that's a reality that once it grabs a hold of your life, Once that fire for Jesus and what he's done for you begins to burn bright in your heart, that's a desire and a love that can swallow up any sinful struggle you've experienced throughout your days on this earth. I'm going to pray and we'll sing. Father, thank you for this morning and our time together. God, I pray in the coming moments that maybe there are some here this morning who have struggled in this area for years, and this is the first time that they really believe It's possible to have freedom here. 
not primarily through their discipline or effort, but through your grace, through the empowering of your Holy Spirit, and through the way in which our love for you can overwhelm our love for anything else in this world. Thank you for loving us and saving us. Thank you for sending your son to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And Father, I pray this would be a church marked by a deep love for you because we remember who we were, we remember who we're becoming, and we remember all that you have promised to us in spite of ourselves, not because of who we are. Father, we love you. We ask this all in your son's name. Amen.